All right, well, I just wanted to start by saying thank you for doing this. And um, I was also wanted to ask y'all if you could just introduce yourselves, however you'd like to be identified. My name, my government name is Diana Brooks, and my spiritual name, everybody call me Omi, uh, Omi CLD. And what's the significance of, of that name? The crown that brings water. Uh, my birth name, or I should say government name, like they call it, was Edwin Joseph. Uh, in about 2001, when I went to Mecca, I had my name officially changed to Safiullah Sadiqa Yusuf. Yeah, I'm a Muslim. So what that means, in Islam, we should have a name that exemplifies either an attribute that you have or an attribute you're trying to get. Now my first name, Safiula, that's the name that God called Abraham, I mean best friend of God. Beautiful. And that keeps me going, that's high objective, whereas I know I'm not God's best friend. That's a high objective for me. My middle name is Sadika. I mean, one who gives charity, and I'm a giver. And you know, I'll give you the shit off my back. My last name, which was formerly Joseph, was changed to Yusuf, which is Joseph. Which is Arabic. Joseph. Still <laughs> Joseph, you know, so that's why it stands now. And thank you for having us in your home. Oh, um, you're quite welcome. Um, quite welcome. So next question is, if you could just tell me briefly your relationship to Alvin and Robinson. Well, I, I would consider Alvin, or Shine as we called him, as one of my best friends, you know, because of the way he was. Shine was a very gentle person. He was big. If you see him, Shine was maybe over six feet and 300 some pounds. But he was a gentle giant. And we connected real good. And he was a tremendous musician. Tremendous musician. And like I said, if he, I thought if he'd had better handles, he, he, you would hear about him in the record for, for all times. Because he could really sing, you know. Yeah. So I used to bring him around, shine hard, and never had a car to grow. And I have a station wagon. They called me, Coach, <laughs> won't you take me on the gig? And I'd go and get him, and when we get to the place, I never had to pay to get in, or, you know, I was drinking at the time. The whole night would be free drinking, and everybody knew him, and, any song he wanted you to sing, what you want to sing, Doc? <laughs> and I'd tell him, and he could sing Ray Charles' song, just almost better than Ray Charles, Ruby, all kind of songs. I mean, Shine could really sing, so. He sung, he sung at my wedding. I didn't have much money. He got David Lasty and a whole band sung for me. And matter of fact, he was such a good friend to me, and his wife was out of town. When he died, I, I had my sister to, to do a repair for him. And of course, I was one of the pallbearers. I had to bring him down, because he was such a beautiful person. And matter of fact, when he died, Shine was on his way up here to see me. Yeah, he had just left oh, yeah. that domino house. He had got his numbers. By then, he was on uh, dialysis. Yeah. And uh, he had left the dialysis center, went by fax, and uh, they sit there a while, and he told Coach, you know, he was on the way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, what happened, the St. Claude Bridge was going up. He was coming across the bridge. He was walking to the other side. And when he saw the bridge coming up, he started to run. And I think with his physical conditioning, he, he, he had a heart attack. So I didn't know he was dead. This was like 10 o'clock at night. So I was teaching school, so I was coming home, and one of the guys in the neighborhood who knew I knew Shine said, Coach, did you hear that Shine died last night? I said, what? I was all upset. So I started rumbling around and calling for me and found out it was the truth. But a real good person, friend of mine. Yeah, mm -hmm. tremendous individual and a, a great singer, great singer, you know. And he would all the time tell me, 
coach, we're going to be rich one day. <laughs> Soon I'm making big, I'm going to take, we're going to go everywhere. And like, he would go overseas with Dr. John and went, open up for Dr. John. But in reality, Dr. John should have been opening up for him. He was better than Dr. John, but he didn't have that, that name recognition as such. And if you notice Dr. John singing, he tried to talk almost like Shine, with that raspiness. He tried to sing like Shine. That's where you get that from. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He helped, he helped um, Dr. John a lot when he came out to the California, because a lot of them had left and went to California in the mid-60s. And uh, he helped Dr. John a lot. I want to get to that, but before we do, can you tell us your relationship with him? And then we're going to start a little further back and work our way up to Okay. Uh, well, we share a grandmother, Mary Thomas Miller, but I'm also uh, his cousin. No, I'm his, his niece, Mary Miller. I'm going to get it right. We share a grandmother, and he's also my uncle. So his cousins, I'm, you know, like that. Yeah. I don't know if that's right. But anyway, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> nah, that's another story. But anyway, uh, Shine, he was surrounded by music as a child. And our family pretty much, you know, they had that essence in the home always. Um, we come from down there, from Empire, Trump Funk and La Boheme all the way at the end. We always looked like we had to move. It was real bad with the Perez's and a lot of the white council down there. So you used to have to get in where you fit in and stay in groups. To so stay we're talking about St. Bernard Parish, uh -huh. which was notorious for white Blackman supremacist Paris. activity. Yes. So we left, they used to grow rice and sugar cane and stuff and hunt. They had great fishing and hunting and stuff and plaquemines. But then we moved up because they started doing the Earl, uh, they started with the standard Earl projects and stuff back there. So um, what happened after they left Plaquemines, they moved to St. Bernard in um, Faisonville. And that's a small black village that was there. And it was uh, founded by a guy named Faison, you know. And um, they stayed there for a good while till the old people died. Then a lot of them like, uh, the Rileys, the Lasties. We had uh, our cousin, the Cages, Ralph Cager and them. They played music. They had like a brass band and stuff with the church back there. So there was always music there. That's in Faisonville had the brass band at the church? Yeah, a benevolent society to help build the schools and stuff like that. So I think when uh, I would say Mary, mother is Harriet. Harriet, she moved there with uh, her husband, Benjamin. Uh, the first husband she had was Mary's real father. Valentine Thomas came from Plaquemines. Valentine's mother was Frances Riley. So you see how I start to okay. tie in? Okay, well, I'm not going to say no more about that. But anyway, when Harriet, she died. Mary and them was already up here. They had moved here because they had gotten married. Up here being in New Orleans. Yeah, in New Orleans. Mary and her, her um, Mary, um, she married a Jamaican. His name was Prince Miller. Prince Miller and Mary stayed in the Seven Ward. When he died, she moved up here. She got policy money and stuff, and she moved up here in Treme. First St. Philip and St. Claude, then she moved at 821 North Liberty. That's where Shine and his sister and Earl, all of them was born in that house. My mama was born in that house. Everybody was born in that house. And Mary was something called a major lady. She used to be a food peddler. She used to push that car from here all the way down there, general laundry, set up down there. She collected laundry. She became one of those, uh, like her daughter's laundress and a food peddler. So they had a variety of hustles. Shine used to help his grandma 
you know, with the with the vending and stuff. Did she sing when she was out there? She sung in a spiritual church. Mm. They were spiritualists. So they wore white a lot, wrapped their head up. They used to follow this guy named Father Divine and all. Mm. Uh, uh, they had a uh, seal, my mother seal, Palu and them crossed the canal because we had cousins and family cross the canal and still down there in the parish. So they used to do that, you know? They kept communication with the Night Ward. When Vi got a certain age, she uh, still stayed with her mama primarily, his mother. But you got to remember, he had his older sister, Shirley. Shirley was for um, a musician. Huh? Her last name is Johnson. I'm not calling her father's name. Then she, he, she, Vi had Earl, Barbarain. I'm not calling his father's name. Earl played the drums like his father. I'm not calling names, okay? <laughs> and then she met Okra Man brother. That's Will, William Robinson. That's Shine Dad. He was a banjo player. Wait, so that Mr. Okra, that we, so the people that, that know Mr. Okra. That's Shine's uncle. That's Shine's uncle. It's and he, and he played And he played banjo? Uh -huh. Shine Dad played banjo. Wow. Uh-huh. Hold it one second. If you don't mind, I'd like to take away the poster because we got that. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Yeah, go ahead. All right. <laughs> so, well, hang on. So let me track one thing. I'm trying to understand the Ninth Ward connection. The Ninth Ward. So, because I get, so if, if he moved from Faisonville straight to Treme, where does the Ninth Ward connection come the in? The Ninth Ward connection come in is when Vi bought a house on Johnson Street, round the corner from the Cages and everybody. Because I think the Riley stayed on Desalone. A Shining that was on between Tupelo and Johnson, and that was a double house. Shirley stayed on one side. Vi and Mr. Williams, or oh, well, you know, he stayed on the other side, and Shine stayed there with them. So that's that but that's after Treme or before? Oh, um, after Treme, cause okay. in in the fifties, Mary died. Looked like everybody in our family started dying, and Urban Renewal came in, and we had to move. You know. Right. So, cause the house on Liberty was in the footprint of what became Armstrong Park. Mm -hmm. Right, so that the city took that over and started kicking people well, out. Well, yeah, the people started kicking people out, but Mary died. Mary died in '55. Um, my grand, my great grandfather died in '55. A lot of people in my family died at that time. By then, Shining and was staying on Johnson and Tupelo. Okay. But Shine went to um, like I said, all the children lived with Mary. Right there on St. Claude and St. Philip, and then they were staying at 821 Liberty. Shine went to Craig's school. He went to Clark, you know. So he was under, I think he was under, Miss Bush was over there at Clark at the time. I'm not sure. Yvonne Bush. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was at Clark as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, she was at Clark. She had him, Jane Black, a lot of great musicians. Then she was at Carver with me. Okay. Yeah, you, you were in our classic Carver? My brother was. My brother was a musician. I was an athlete. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, at what age did you meet Sean? Oh, I was a grown man. Oh, I might have been 20, 21, like that. And see, in the night world, they had a lot of great musicians. The Lassie brothers, David, Papi, Melvin. You had Oop Poopa Do, uh, Hill. Jesse Hill. Jesse Hill, you had. Oliver Morgan, La La. You all had Fat Domino, people. all in the Lord Night Ward. In the Lord yeah, Night Ward was the descendants of Faisonville, Plaquemine Parish, being displaced or wanting to better themselves after they marriage. The next generation bought houses in the Lord Night yeah. Ward. Vi bought a house in the Lord Night Ward. My great grandma bought a house in the Lord Night Ward, yeah. you know? But I remember explicitly Mary, his grandmother, my grandmother being a matriarch. They always had a tendency to come here in this area. Why um, her business? 
She was a laundress. She used to get all the clothes from the madams. They say my madam. And the laundry and stretch those drapes. People on St. Charles, um, they had, you know, they used to give laundry to people to do. The, and she had that business. She had the food court business. My great grandfather worked it as a vegetable vendor. And this was over here in the French market. So you had a lot of reasons why they was up this way. Then. And we should say, we say up this way, we're in Treme right In Treme. You had, uh, like my great grandfather and them, they used to go off show. Like Earl, she, he used to be a merchant marine like Prince, you know. And so Uncle William, Alvin Daddy, he used to take in, he was a, a merchant marine. So you had a lot of activity that brought you from the ninth, the lower ninth ward to Treme until we basically just stayed in the lower ninth ward. And when you said there was a lot of music in the home, can you share some more examples? Of that? Yeah, mm -hmm. Shirley could sing and beat them tambourines. My mama could beat them tambourines and sing. Um, Mary and them could sing, beat those tambourines, and Sean and them played in the church. In the spiritual church. In the spiritual church. And so when he was down the Lower Ninth Ward, do you know, was he at um, Mother Catherine Seals? Was that, that was like a regular place that the family well, would go? Well, from what I remember, I think they visited different churches. Gotcha. You know, the spiritual community, they had Palu in them down there, Bishop Francis. He's old, he like about oh, almost nine years old. He, he up there on uh, First and Claybone. He got a, he, he's, he's in the church up there. So you had spiritual people like Mother Wilkerson, Mother Anderson, and Seal, all of these people, they had churches and they visit each other church. Mm -hmm. Most of them had a musical component, you know, to the church, so. You know, but once he got to be a teenager, you know how teenagers, that ain't happening no more. You got it? So, yeah. Well, when he was a teenager, I understand that he was in a band with Bob and George French and uh, Kid Jordan and James Rivers. Do y'all know anything about that? I don't know anything about it, but I know this much. As well as he could play, everybody wanted him to play with him. Yeah, and like when Wolfman came to town, Wolf was his understudy. Wolfman used to open up for Shine. And like in the latter days, Shine, when they go overseas, Shine was opening up for Dr. John. Wolf used to open up for Shine. But, uh, and then Shine came along at the same time, he was playing music at, at Clark. Aaron Neville and them were going like to coin uptown. You know? And so they went competition. Uh, singing and they were good, all good friends. Yeah, you they know? was all yeah. good friends. And all of them could sing, you know. Yeah, so that's interesting because Shine would, he was Aaron's band leader in the mid 60s, but they had actually known each other from their high school days yeah. then. Yeah, and see, uh, they had a band called the Hawkettes. Art right. Neville, Aaron, and all of them. Yeah, but Shine used to play a lot of time with the boy from downtown. We say downtown the Lord Main World, especially the Lasty brothers. Yeah, let me ask you about the Lasty family. So, was what can you tell me just about his relationships with different members of the Lasties? Like they must have known each other from the neighborhood. Very, yeah. very close. Yeah. Very close. But I'm gonna let Harlan and them talk to you, and I'm gonna let Joseph talk to you, and I'm gonna let Cyril talk to you yeah. about their relationships with them. Yeah. You know when y'all. You know. Sure. But yeah. um, he That's used right. to play at the 504 Club. Mm -hmm. He used to play at San um, Jacinto. Yeah. You know, he played in a lot of clubs, you know. Yeah. And the locals, that's what they did, you know. Yeah. yeah. But see, with the last, like Harold and Raleigh, his mother, his mother was a lastie, Betty Ann, and she sung. And I think her husband was Buddy Williams. And Buddy Williams was a musician. So all of them was just like that. So a lot of time we'd go out, man, and, oh, man, Buddy might sing, or uh, Ben Ann might sing, Shine or sing. And those last brothers, all of them played different instruments, you know. And just like Herlin, when Herlin started off playing, 
Berlin was the drummer. Berlin, that Jane Black was the drummer. Jane Black used to play the trumpet because I went to Southern University with James, tremendous musician. But uh, they were just musicians. Yeah, and Shine Daddy played that banjo, and Shine learned a lot from his father. Mm -hmm. Uncle yeah. William, mm -hmm. I can see him now. I can see him now. As a child, I remember they used to practice in the living room. And it was amazing just to see all of these people, you know, and listen to the music. The neighbors didn't complain. New Orleans didn't, people didn't complain about music, you know, back then. And the house was small. It was a mm -hmm. double, but it was small. But you could feel the flow board. Yeah. They used to roll in there, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, I used to do a lot of practice sessions with them. Around there, the boy named Wiley used to be the bass player for him. And he had a little garage. And Pop P would be on the drum. That's Walter Lasky. David played the tenor. Now the older brother was Melvin. Once Melvin got real good, he went to California. But I had my track team up there run that UCLA one time. And so I went around by Shine House. They were living in LA. Him and Morris Bashman, Mo, Mo played the, the sax too. He came from the Lord Night Ward. He the one that encouraged me to get a saxophone. And I thought you just had to say, do, do, do. And I found out she had to play A, B, C. <laughs> man, I told my daddy, man, I got to go practice the baseball practice. I got time for this. My daddy wanted to kill me. But I gave the sax to my little brother, and he got in this bush band that called But Shine and him, all these to practice, 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 practice. And he'd always be with them. <laughs> and I said, there comes Shine. Happy go lucky Shine. Yeah, know? he was happy go, uh, go lucky. We yeah. have a cousin, I laugh. His name is Alvin Robinson. I have a cousin. They named him Alvin. And they called him Big Ignorant. I said, both of them was very calm, right? But Big Ignorant brought, it brought, the, brought the noise. <laughs> <laughs> but, and their disposition was the same. And we always raised around here. Um, something I wanted to say. Um, one of the last times that I seen him alive, he was standing in the door. Because, you know, we all struggle with different things sometimes, you know. And he had overcome a lot of obstacles, just like uh, Jesse Hill and a lot of other, you know, musicians during that time. You know, Charlie Parker, a lot of different people had, you know, they was battling. And so I watched him overcome that. I watched him give his time and everything back to like Vern and Shorty at the Design Center and all of that. I watched that, you know. So the last time I seen him, I needed help uh, really bad. My son is uh, autistic and he had neurological problems. And I couldn't, I was in trying to go to school, trying to do this, trying to do that. He looked at me and he said, go to California. He said, I'm home now. He said, but I want you to go out there. They have things that's more advanced that can help your kid. And say, just go over there by noon and Donna and, and try to get some help for your baby. So it's gonna be all right, you know. He was always that kind of person that you could go to and you can feel, you know, non-judgmental and very, you know, supportive. Yeah. That's really beautiful. So let me ask you this, where did the name Shine come from? Because he's black. <laughs> oh, forgive uh, me. <laughs> it's true. I tell you what, Rudy, when he sang, he used to sweat a lot. He always had it. From his I got a picture yes, here. Yes, I'm going to find that picture. He have a towel over his shoulder. <laughs> and he would always be white. Yeah, yeah, it's so, it's so, it's so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. A pretty penny. Yeah. He sweat a, a lot. A pretty penny, honey. Yo. Yeah. So when you met him in... Were y'all both in your early 20s when you met? I think Sean was a little bit older than me. Okay, so maybe that was around the time he may have been recording with Imperial Records with Dave Bartholomew? Yeah, by the way, Dave Bartholomew is my, my, my cousin. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, man, we're gonna, be yeah. here all, we're gonna be here all night. But, uh, but I don't know as much about Dave as I know about Sean, because Dave and him came from around Edgar or somewhere. Yeah, that, Edgar. That, that, that part of the world. And I found out later in life that he was kin to me. But after Shine and I got real close, you know, like I said, I used to bring him on a lot of gigs. 
and a lot of times we'd play early in the morning sometime at when everybody would be going in, three and four o'clock in the morning, they'd just be starting. And where would that be? A uh, different club around here. In Treme. Yeah, in Treme area, yeah. And everybody would wait, especially on Sunday. Mm -hmm. You'd have those matinees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. That's the reason why the Treme, you know, because Mary was here, that means you don't have to go all the way downtown. You can just make a pit stop, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. So what are y'all's first memories of when he started recording, you know, when he started getting cutting records in the studio? Do y'all remember, have any sense of the early part of his career in New Orleans when he was getting into that? No. The, the magnitude of his whole life and his musical career for me, it came when I became an adult. Mm. Yeah. And that's when I walked in his house. He stayed in uh, South Central uh, LA off of Figueroa mm. in I think 90 something. And I walked in his house and I looked on the wall and I seen Gold Records, I seen Quincy Jones, um, this other guy Ingram. I seen different artists that he had collaborated with and I was so uh, taken back about the, uh, you know, his best knowledge and his, um, the way he, you know, played. I didn't really realize it, you know? Yeah. One thing I can say is that when Shine really got good in his groove, when he should have been recorded, the way I understand it, he was with a bad manager and the guy was selfish with him and didn't want to cut him loose to some of these big recording companies which really wanted to put him out there in that record world and get him known all over the country. And he would always tell me, man, as soon as I finish this uh, contract with this dude, I'm going to really be rolling, but right now I got the honor of the contract. And the guy held him up and they, for more than, a, you know, for a few years at his prime. And so the next thing you know, he was gone, you know. But you used to tell me all the time, Coach, man, once I finish this time with this guy, we're going to be rich, man. I'm going to take you all over Europe. We're going everywhere. So, and so he had high ambition, but that held him up. So what can you see, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Noni and him got married in Las Vegas. We was little. And I remember him marrying her out there in Las Vegas, you know. And Donna said, I don't know, how you remember all of that? I said, because I remember them talking, you know. But him and his wife got married in Las Vegas. And that's when his career really has picked up, you know. Cause so he did Something You Got in 64. Mm, talking about noon. And, uh, <laughs> is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, um... And then he went. He he moved to Los Angeles. I think a couple of years later. Mm-hmm. Because um, I was about six when he left. Okay. And so one of the people he connected with in Los Angeles was Harold Baptiste, and he had been involved with him a little bit in New Orleans, from mm -hmm. what I understand. Do you know anything about his relationship with Harold? And, no, and I, I really don't. I just know that they worked together, collaborated together. Yeah, I don't know the, the intricacies of that relationship, but they had those two, with Harold Baptiste and Mel Alvin. That's you talking the Baptiste guy? Harold. Yeah. Yeah, they had two different ones. Harold Baptiste and I think Alvin Baptiste. One of them Correct. played a, yeah, those one are, of them yeah. played a clarinet. That's and Alvin. they were big, they were big in a, in a music world, and they both Baptiste. Yeah, yeah, but I don't know Shine relationship them because during that time, a lot of these musicians around here, all of them knew each other. They used to play with each other, you know. And yeah, I'm yeah, old Shine. Session work, session yeah. work, you mm -hmm. know. Right, and so one of the sessions he did in Los Angeles was the was the sort of the transformation of Mac Rebenack into Dr. John, right? Yeah. So he was right. involved in in that making that record and yeah. sort of rolling out the Dr. John mm. persona to persona. the world. Yeah. So yeah. do y'all have any recollections about him dealing with Mac and, and? No, all I know is that I remember 
Uh, Mac was just like young musicians during the, the 40s and the 50s and the early 60s. They struggled. They struggled. And I think they formed a bond, whereas he gave a lot of support to him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. To uplift him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, see, on the end, I know their relationship was like this. Whenever Mac would get a big job like in Europe, he'd bring Shine with him. Mm -hmm. And Shine would open up front. And they'd come back. And Shine, well, he been Shine, or oh, been to Europe. Well, me and, he wouldn't call him Dr. John, he called him, me and Mac. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I knew he was talking about that. Mac coming over here, I gotta go see him over there, and wah, 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 wah. But they were like that, they were real close. But I, I didn't realize that the relationship started long time ago, you know. But they were real close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it seemed like they really collaborated together over decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think Mac was young. He was younger than Shine. And Shine kind of took him under his wing at one time, you know. And I know that they were also writing partners. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you remember anything about Shine in terms of writing music or coming up with his own material? I like I say, the only thing I can tell you about is his, uh, you know, way he was born and yeah, you know, his personality. But when it came down to the music industry, we children um, was a protected class. It's like, okay, let's go. You know, we went on Walt Bortner one time. They had the one Walt Bortner show, and they let us like little bunnies, you know. Hey, but as far as we being a part of that environment, no, we stayed. You know, come yeah. on, get them, you know. Yeah. Well, so then let me ask you more about the, your relationships with him then. So can you tell me about his move back to New Orleans? I think he came back in the 80s, huh? He did. And I think he came back. You know, sometimes roosters come home to roost. I'm one of them. So roosters come home to roost. And he made his rounds. He made his rounds. And I got back here just in time to go to, you know, to be here when it happened. Mm. Sorry. I can tell you one thing. Please. Because I visited Excuse the house in L.A. and here. <clears throat> for struggling music, because you're struggling mm -hmm. to make it big. Need to go. California. Wait, wait, just wait, wait a second. Uh, go, take your call first. Okay, what probably brought Alvin back to New Orleans <clears throat> was the fact that in California, of course, the cost of living is much higher. So if, you can, if you're not recording or gigging on a regular basis, you're hurting. You know, and I saw a lot of musicians out there were struggling. So he came back here, but they had a house. You know, people owned the house, cost of living cheaper. And it wasn't such a strain for him. Yeah, basically that was the reason. So he came back to the Ninth Ward when he came back? Yeah, he came back to the Ninth Ward, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he came back to his, his home. To his you know? Yeah, mm hmm. And when I got out there, you know, um, I, well, I thought he was gonna, you know, come home up there to Los Angeles, but he never did come. So I stayed up there. I got in college. My son, neuro neurological condition, it got a little bit better. But I, uh, I said, "Ooh, this is about to eat me alive." So I came back home, and I was able to spend. The last, you know, uh, weeks or months with him because his sister, the only one that was left out the siblings, she was diagnosed with cancer. So he got a chance to bond with her, you know, and uh, he got a chance to see his friends, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, um, anything else about when y'all were running around in your younger days that we didn't get to? Like, for example, uh, did he ever play the Dewdrop Drop In? Yeah. 
Yeah, I was, I was a little bit before me, a little bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah he played the guitar. I'm only sure if they had music anywhere, <laughs> he probably played that because he was a, a tremendous act. You know, a tremendous act. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he played everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you remember something specific about the Dewdrop? No more than uh, my aunt, his mom of Viola, and the women in the family going there to see him, taking pictures, and they was very uh, happy about it because back then they had uh, women. It, it was a, it was more like a novelty show. It was like they had the big brown beautiful models. They had comedians and he'll play. I remember I was a baby. They took me to Lincoln Park, Lincoln Beach. Mm -hmm. He played at Lincoln Beach a lot with Fast Domino and Irma Thomas and a lot of people. Yeah, I was a baby. I was small. Yeah. yeah. He played a lot of venues here. Well, what you have to remember this. <laughs> when the Dewdrop was really the Dewdrop Black Mecca, he had the Robin Hood. The Robin this was during Hood. the time of segregation. Uh -huh. So these were the two meccas here, the do drop the Robin Hood. And A lot Robin of the top musicians, Rachel, when they come in town, they would go to those places. That's where the music was. That's where the, you know, from prostitutes on down, where, where, it was, where the action was the at. The action was. Yeah, do drop the Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. You know, he couldn't go to many other places. They were during the time of segregation, you know. It was what it was, you know what I'm saying? And it was more like a supper club atmosphere, you know? Mm -hmm. They had the strip masons. Yeah. I wonder, well, speaking of segregation, um, you know, so when he moved to Los Angeles, I know that, like, for musicians like Earl Palmer, I mean, he, ha he happened to be in a relationship with a white woman, and I think part of his motivation in moving was getting out of this environment. The well, yeah. You know, yeah. do you know in Shine's life was, you know, was um, his relationship to the racial politics of New Orleans and then leaving for those decades, do you know if, um, if that was part of his, uh, part of why he stayed in L.A.? I mean, was he... No, he no. followed the music. Yeah. yeah. The music. Because everybody during that time, they was going that way. Going that way, you know? It was a lot of Ninth War people in Los Angeles specifically, uh, yeah. right? Because it was Melvin Lasty right, was there. Right. Jesse Hill was out there. Mm -hmm. That was one of the motivations for him. Because Melvin left almost you know, five or six years before Shine. And Melvin was doing real good up there. And so they collaborated and talking to his brothers, uh, Pop P and David. You know, he thought he could do the same thing, but maybe the same connection wasn't that. And David, I mean, Melvin probably would have had, probably had a better manager, and he still hooked up with this guy around here, and he didn't have the latitude that Melvin had, so that kind of stymied him in a way of speaking. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you said that he, uh, Shine had a tremendous act. Like, could you describe the act, like uh, what he looked like? Did he move? Did he dance? And oh, the whole thing. what he looked like? He was about Shine was about six feet two or three, <laughs> three hundred and fifty pounds, <laughs> and always whistling. <laughs> Even when he tuned his guitar, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, hey, Shine, and uh. Everybody wanted to sing the blues. He could sing the blues. I mean, he had the soul. I mean, and, and what a lot of people don't understand about the blues, you have to live that. Yeah, you got to know it. See, a lot of guys try to sing the blues, and they be faking it. They be mimicking. You got to live the blues. When you live hard, then that's how he was living, because he, he was still struggling to make it big, and he had that talent, and he knew he had it. But he was in a box, you know, and... Uh, Man, when he started singing the blues, the whole the whole joint would just, you know, they would, everybody sing it, shine. He could sing too. I used to like to hear him sing a lot of Ray Charles songs, you know. Yeah, yeah. It brings a tear. He'd bring the place down. Mm -hmm. Shine could sing, and then he had a habit. 
he knew he knew some of the things that Ray Charles had done music wise and he would always tell his musicians a lot of times got to slow it down slow three and so and so yeah to really get that rhythm that Ray Charles had they'd be playing a little fast no slow it down slow it down slow it down <laughs> and when they slow it down that's when Alvin would start singing you see that sweat you see that sweat coming off me? He put his head like that on that guitar. Yeah, he was a hell of a act. Mm -hmm. When my mom was young, she was a teenager, and this had to be when she was like about 15 or 16 years old. They played a big show in Miami. Something was going on in Miami. It had something to do with uh, uh, Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. I think Muhammad Ali had a fight or something down there, a boxing fight or something. It was in Miami, overtown area like that. My mama wanted to go because she was just want to go. And Shine said, I can't take you, Ma. Booney, I can't take you because ain't nobody here to watch you. You need a chaperone. My mama snuck on a tour bus and she went anyway. She got a whooping when she come back. <laughs> But he looked out for it and took care. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Yeah, he he was a, he was a good person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he'd give you his last. Yeah, it just so I, you know, I find that a lot. You know, like I was in the sports and teaching. Some of your greatest athletes they didn't make it. They still got stories about them. Yeah, the legend. Park legend, uh, New Orleans legend, they never made it to the big time. I know a lot of them in there. Any sports you can name are better than some of the ones who made it. I and was, it, I, you know, I think about that with Shine a lot. I, the the name that came to my mind was Marcus Dupree, this running back. Yeah, a big guy from Mississippi. That's right. Because it was like mm -hmm. he had this talent that it was just obvious to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but the way his life went, I, I mean, think his, his uncle messed him up. Yeah. He, had, he had an uncle who he, he really depended on that mind, and this guy was supposed to be like almost a man and was taking his money from him. Mm. And that's hurtful. You know, you think you got money here, and you out there getting hit on Sunday, broken up, and then you find out you don't have nothing. Mm. You know, you but it's people. this, you know, these stories about how when the when the career doesn't is doesn't live up to the scale of the talent, you know, but it, in in Shine's case, you listen to those records and it's like, where like why isn't this a number one? Why isn't this yeah. on everybody's radar right now? Yeah. And I think it's a, a testament to his his talent that so many New Orleans artists are, were so effusive about. I mean, from Mac to Harold Baptiste to Dave Bartholomew to Aaron Neville. The people who were fortunate enough to catch the breaks in the industry. Yeah. You got to look at what happened with Aaron. Yeah. I mean, he died out, you know, for a while until uh, Linda Ronset helped rejuvenate, right. you know, his career. I think, you know, the music scene of um, New Orleans music, it, it begins to fade. It began to fade. That's why they had to leave, you know. And, um, Every now and then, some jazz affectionados, you know, they take and put a spark in it to bring us back, you know. Do you know how he felt about it? I mean, was he, um, did he feel like, hey, I made these amazing records and I know what I can do when I've, I've done my thing? Or did he feel like, you know, I was I was done wrong here and, and I never seen that in him. No. Yeah. He wasn't no cry baby. No. He knew that if he ever, you know, he could get that break with with that guy, he could sign him with the right people because they had a lot of big people who wanted to sign him. Mm -hmm. Big recording companies, you know. But that hindered him. And then a lot of things that you all know, brother, and proud of your profession and others. It's all about timing sometimes. Time just ain't Time. right. That's just right. like for myself. Uh, a lot of people consider me one of the greatest coaches that come through this town, all around football, basketball. That he is. I can name you the athletes I've coached. 
I started a track club down here called the New Orleans Super Day. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. That was before that girls track in high school down here. So I had junior high school and high school girls I was coaching running at the parks. So I decided we're going to go big. We're going to run on the national scene. So they didn't have any high schools. So I would go to the big meets like the Texas Relays, Texas Southern Relays. Go out to California, run UCLA. We run at Madison Square Garden. But the thing about it, it was all about time. And then they saw where the girls were good, so they got girls tracked down in high school. We were beating colleges. We were beating LSU, University of Florida, University of Texas with junior high and high school girls. But the timing wasn't right for the big thing. Like, guys said, well, why you, they didn't hire you at LSU. Why didn't hire you? The timing, situation, segregation, a bunch of things. I don't cry about it, because I do what I do from my heart. I wasn't getting paid for that, you know? But that's the same like with Sean. And I never heard him bitter about no. that, you know? It never was. Mm -mm. Yeah, he was happy. Yeah, did what he had to do. The bitterness just bring you down and bring you back, you know, we can't do that now. I also think that some people in the, in the industry, that were in the industry for as long as he was, in particular, like, you sort of appreciate how arbitrary some of these things are. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you never know what record's going to hit what mm -hmm. level on the chart. You just know when you cut it that... It, it's a hit. That it, yeah. 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 Just like Kato. We used to play basketball together all around Mississippi and New Orleans. And Kato, Kato was very funny, you know. Get a ball to Kid Dash, DOE, baby. Best of the goals. Man, I'm not throwing you the ball no more. But once he started making some songs and hit, back to back, bumping on, wah, 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 wah. And of course, he had a lot of flair with him. He was very good on the stage. But for us, just to sing, I don't think he was, matter of fact, I know he wasn't in Shine class, but it was the timing of it. And he, he was a good act too. You couldn't take nothing away from him. But he wasn't no Shine for us being able to really sing and move the crowd. But the timing of it, you know. Good timing yeah. and a European um, audience. Because another thing I know, this is with a lot of uh, musicians, that was based here, their music took off in Europe and other places in the world. And when this occurred, that's when we look and say, wow, you know what I'm saying? But if it wasn't for outside of our city, outside of our region, you wouldn't get the recognition. Right, and we should say, so Shine passed when he was what? 50, 51. 51. He's not an old man by Very any stretch. Very young. Uh -huh. and, and it occurs to me that he missed out on the sort of revival of interest in this material, that if he had been playing jazz fests all through the 90s, right? Yes. Then he would have got a rounder records or an alligator records contract. He would have got so. You know what I mean? But uh, uh, he told me out of his mouth. He said, man, you know, they want to hire me for peanuts at the jazz fest. Give me two or three thousand dollars. And they would bring out, I forgot the name of that act, and, uh, I'll think of it. They bring this guy from New York or somewhere, paying him forty, fifty thousand dollars plus airfare for his band, plus hotel, all accommodation, and he won't pay me three thousand dollars. Local actors, I can't, I can't play for that. Yeah, well, yeah. Cato made the same calculation. With you know, yeah. I think a lot of artists had that experience with Jazz Fest. Yeah. You know, but I mean, Jazz Fest notwithstanding, just the idea that yeah. uh, he was a young man and he he obviously he hadn't lost his his chops or anything no, no, like that. No, indeed. He just was cut down in his prime by illnesses, you know, hypertension, you know, and stuff like that. It take his toll on us, you know, and you can imagine the long hours of practicing and trying to also work on a job, you know, because he was working. He was working on a job in Los Angeles. Do you know what he was doing? Um, 
I, I'm trying to remember. One time, one of his second jobs was, because <laughs> he had two jobs. One of his second jobs was, I believe, as a valet. Parking. Oh, yeah. Uh, you don't hear that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. The sign of the time, brother. Yeah.